So we've talked a little bit about this idea that conflicts end through maybe a rational calculation involving actors in which they're trying to figure out how to divide up a pie, but maybe they disagree about sort of what would happen if there was conflict and therefore they can't come up to a, come to a, uh, a workable agreement on what that division should look like. And then conflict sort of helps facilitate that process of learning. And maybe that helps us to understand why conflicts end the way they do um, in terms of negotiation. But all that rests on sort of a, a rational foundation that people are, are, are being strategic and they're calculating and they're thinking about this in terms of costs and benefits and, and weighing different um, options and paths and possibilities against each other. But there are other ways to think about conflict resolution that don't rest upon that sort of rationalist assumption that maybe uh, use slightly different ways of thinking about human behavior. And so I'd like to talk about ripeness theory as it's been put forward by uh, William Zartman as a way of thinking about this idea of, of how do civil wars end and how should we think about this. And so I'll just begin with um, kind of a simple model of uh, how a conflict might play out. So initially there's a latent conflict and then it emerges and the intensity of the conflict sort of starts escalating. Um, suddenly the conflict is, is at a full-blown war, but as that escalation process comes along, one of the sides, the rebels or the government, is able to win a decisive victory and then so the intensity of the conflict you know, collapses and we end up in sort of post-conflict peace building. And I think if you are the government or the rebel, that's maybe the side, that, that's the pathway that you're hoping or you're anticipating um, things will play out with your side being victorious. But you can also have the conflict play out this way, where it's, you know, latent conflict that starts gaining momentum, and then you reach a point where you can't really escalate anymore. You're mobilized fully, you're doing everything you can, and yet the conflict isn't ending you're stalemated, um, and you're stalemating at, stalemated at a very high level of intensity, um, which we might describe as a hurting stalemate. And when both parties perceive that they're sort of stuck in this situation, that it's a mutually hurting stalemate, um, that can set off sort of a, a, a panic, a, a, uh, a maybe not a, a rational, but a, a, a shock um, that this is a dangerous and, and, and unpalatable and unsustainable place to be, and yet not knowing how to get out of it. And that sort of panic that comes when the realization of a mutually hurting stalemate allows for parties to break from the conflict process that they've been in and attempt to de-escalate or to attempt to negotiate their way out of the conflict. And that may lead, may, to settlement and then sort of a post-conflict um, peace building process. And I want to flag this um, and these, these two different sort of ways that this might play out because parties don't actually know which model is likely going to be relevant, right? They don't know when they start that process of escalation if they're going to be able to escalate to victory or if they're going to escalate and just find themselves in a, a really bad, horrific situation um, with no easy way out of, we could think about this conflict as maybe a process of discovery. And just like with the rational um, choice approach where sort of conflict helps to clarify what's likely to happen um, from fighting for parties who maybe had different perspectives on this. There's a discovery process of whether or not you can escalate your way out of these conflicts. Um, and that discovery process, right, involves sort of what you're able to do. It involves what your adversary is able to do. Maybe an outside actor will um, come in and tip the balance and, and help, or it may result in you getting stuck in one of these stalemates. And when you're in those hurting stalemates and both sides come to the realization that they, they just can't win, that's a moment where ripeness may be possible. And I say may be possible because there's a dissatisfaction with the status quo, right? Both sides are feeling like this cannot go on, we're stuck, the costs are mounting, and we need to find a way to get out of this situation are you willing now at this moment to try negotiation? And it may be that you are willing to do that, but it might be that you still aren't ready because you don't believe you have a, a viable partner at the table who you can negotiate with, or because you don't really see a, a way of resolving this. Um, you haven't sort of thought through the creative option. So there's sort of two components um, from Zartman's concept of ripeness that kind of come into play here, right? There's the mutually hurting stalemate that both parties want out but there also has to be a belief, a perception that there's a way forward, um, that, that there's a, a way out of this, that you can actually use negotiation to solve your problem. And unless you have both of those pieces, that sort of panicked moment of we have to get out of this 
and the perception of, and this is the way forward, you don't actually have a moment of ripeness. But when those do those two things do come together, those are the moments in which you can actually see parties um, moving to the bargaining table. And I think really importantly from Zartman's perspective is that this isn't necessarily a rational process, right? It's not like there's like a triggering moment where a certain amount of pain causes parties to, to think about the, the hurting stalemate. This is something that is, is I don't want to say irrational, but is maybe there's a component of emotion. Maybe there's a component of identity that gets woven up into things. Maybe there's hatred. And so Zartman sometimes talks about conflicts becoming twice dominant, where there's the issue that you were fighting about initially. That's that's part of the problem. But then there's also the animosity that grows up amongst the actors involved, that, that hatred that also becomes part and, and of the conflict and gets woven into it. And so being able to push through that hatred, being able to push through that emotional investment, and even that sense of identity that's come to sort of, you know, be part of how we understand ourselves relative to that conflict can be really difficult. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons why Zartman stresses that this isn't a, you know, cost-benefit calculation. This is oftentimes a surprise that people didn't realize just how bad things had gotten until it just sort of finally sinks in and then hits them that this is not something that's going the direction that they wanted. Um, and so there's that element of shock, um, there's that element of desperation, but it still has to be paired with the perception um, that there's a way forward. And again, that perception isn't necessarily rational either. Um, it can come from um, you know, ungrounded or unwarranted faith in an, in an adversary, um, but if you don't have at least the ability to convince yourself this might work, you're not gonna move this forward uh, to conflict resolution.